Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Have you found yourself staying up late at night or even dreaming about self-storage? I mean, this is a real estate investing podcast, so this is a possibility. And even if you haven't found yourself in that predicament, I think this show is going to hit for you because we go in depth on self-storage, why it's a great asset class, what it is compared to other asset classes, and why our guest, Fernando Angelucci, went from wholesaling to acquisitions and into self-storage, and now self-storage as syndicated equities. You'll find him by the name of the storage stud, and if you know that, you know you need to listen to this episode. Let's do it. This is episode 126 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Fernando Angelucci. He is the CEO of SSSE. We're going to talk all about self-storage today. He started in residential, got into multi, transitioned all the way into self-storage full-time. Fernando, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jen. Yeah, no, I'm excited to talk to you. And we first met on a mastermind where we dragged you on to tell us all about self-storage. It's probably like two, three years ago now. So I'm excited to see what you've been up to. When was the first time that you remember being interested just in real estate? Yeah, very easy. I was 16 years old and I picked up a book of uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And from there, I I never liked reading. I was one of those kids that liked to clown around and stuff and devoured the entire book in two days. And from that day on, I knew I was going to become a real estate investor. Yeah, it's it's funny because it, like a lot of us always make fun. Oh, you're going to tell the rich dad poor dad story, but like for for most people, that book really just is the thing that unlocks it because it's so accessible to read. And then say like, wait, I could be that kid. What was the first thing that you did to put it in play at 16 to like say like I'm going to start taking steps for this to be my future? Yeah, so you know I'm a son of two immigrants, so when I started talking about you know being a business owner and potentially not going to college. My dad threatened to end my life. Um, so I actually went to college first. And when I was 19, I started my first company, which was a company painting the exteriors of residential buildings. So mm. I'd go to school at University of Illinois. And then on the weekends, I'd go back to Chicago, make offers or estimates for people. And during the summer, I'd book them up for the summer and then I'd hire my friends to start the painting company. So that was... Yeah, yeah. To date, probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life because it was the first time I ever had to run a business. Yeah. And from there, then I knew I was I was ready to go. And once I graduated, I lasted, I don't even think I lasted 13 months as an engineer and yeah. immediately <laughs> went to starting to flip houses and, and assignments of contract. Do you feel like that because you were painting the exterior of houses as a business, it was also you able to see like, hey, wait, we just increased the value. Did the, the wheels start to click on that while you were doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So there was a lot of things that I learned from doing that painting business. You know, the first was estimating. Although I was just estimating paint jobs, I also had to show them, hey, if you paint the exterior of your house before you sell, look at how much extra value and curb appeal you can sell for. If I already started yeah. thinking about, okay, how does this... How is this an input into an investment and where does the return come from? Yeah, but that's interesting though, because you were young at the time and I've talked to so many people who are now full-fledged investors and they said, you know, I had a personal residence and a couple of rentals, but I didn't think I was an investor. And I was like, what? I mean, because I try to convince first-time home buyers, you're an investor, like this is the biggest investment you made. What do you think it was about where you were at or maybe where you wanted to go that made you think like investing? I can see where this is going to make money. These are all investments. Yeah, the thing for me was always time freedom. So, you know, my family in the beginning was kind of a tough go trying to establish themselves in the United States. Yeah. But then once they started catching traction, 
and getting good jobs, I realized that they were wor- they were exchanging a lot of time for those jobs. So, you know, there was times yeah. where my dad, every Monday, he would f- have to fly to a different city, stay there until Friday, and then come back. And I didn't want that lifestyle. I wanted t- to be able to do what I wanted, when I wanted, with whomever I wanted. And I realized that the only way to achieve that is by controlling my own time freedom, by, by having a, a business or, a, or an investment vehicle. Yeah, I think that's pretty common, though, for for immigrant culture, for how do you have to get up there, you have to just do the work wherever it comes from scale up, and then you can end up doing great. But it's still like you said, you never end up with that, really that that time freedom that was expected. But it's great if they can transfer to you as a child who can say, well, I learned the work ethic from you. But now I want to modernize that so I don't have to leave for the whole week. So when did the light bulb start to go off where you said, I can I can figure out a way into this money wise and then start to make money in real estate? Yeah. So I'm going to give a disclaimer to your listeners who are new. Do not do what I'm about to tell you that I did. OK, <laughs> I think a lot of so, people need to give that disclaimer. It's fair. So at the time, I didn't have much money. I was about maybe six months or seven months into my job at a fortune 50 company. And I was hating it. I was, you know, I had to leave the house at five, six in the morning. I wouldn't get back until six to 8 PM every day. I'd have to spend nights on the road. And I said, I got to get out of this. So I, you know, I saw, I still had my, my copy of rich dad, poor dad on my bookshelf there. And I said, there has to be more to this. I already read through all of his regular series and an advisor yeah. advisor series. And I, and then I, I just so happens I was doing something on the internet and they said, I was living in Des Moines, Iowa at the time. And they said in Des Moines, Iowa, this weekend, a free three day Robert Kiyosaki course, lunch included. So I was like, okay, let's go. Yeah. So went to that and at Wait, did you event. go because it was Kiyosaki or because it was lunch included? And you're like, I mean, that sounds pretty good. I mean, it was a little bit of both, you know. I was uh, <laughs> fresh out of college, no right. money in my pocket. So take I'll free take lunch. free food. Yeah, yeah, wherever it comes. Yeah. And so I went there and they taught us how to access money th- through credit cards, uh, cash advances to do your first contract assignment to get money to do yeah. to do the, the marketing. And so... Overnight, I did exactly what they told me to do. I applied to like 64 credit cards and I got 12 <laughs> approved. And when all 12 show, I, wait, I waited for all 12 to show up. And once all 12 showed up, at the, um, within the same hour, I cash, cash advanced the max limit off everyone. Yeah. And I had yeah. $97,000 in my bank account. So that's how I started. And then to make things worse, I immediately quit my job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that you gave the disclaimer because I can see somebody writing a list down. Okay, max out 97,000 on 20 credit cards, quit job. Not as a 22 year It is going to work, but I mean, there, I think there's probably you're going to finish this. We'll go over advice on how not to do it that way. But look, this right. is how you got started. So yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> exactly. And so one of the things that I noticed, I you know, you see all these statistics about people starting businesses and like 90% fail in the first year. And then of those that, that survive in the next five years, 90% of those fail. So you are yeah. literally, a, you're trying to hit 1% of business ownership. And what usually causes people to fail is a lack of motivation. And the thing about motivation, it isn't consistent. It goes up and it goes down. So how do yeah. you prepare yourself for when your motivation is low? And one of the easiest ways for me was there's no other option. For yeah. me to put food on the table and pay my rent, I have to make this work. Plus, yeah. you know, once these credit card interest rates start kicking, I'm burning interest, you know, per day, per hour. I actually had a spreadsheet that showed me how much interest I paid per month, per day, per hour to like motivate me to work, you know? Yeah. And also from one thing that you said before, you couldn't at this point go back to your dad or your parents and say like, hey, I went for it and I failed. Can you help me? Like, that's going to be a definite No. And when I told my dad that I not only took out all this credit card debt, which in my household debt is evil. Yeah, yeah. And then I told him that I quit the dream job that they had for me in the same sentence. It wasn't a I'm mad at you. It's just like a silence of disappointment type of (laughs) but you know, to their credit, they've always been very supportive and you know, they had their hesitancies. But I said, Listen, you guys taught me work ethic. I'm going, there's, I, there is no option for failure. I'm going to make this work. It may take yeah. a couple of years, but trust me. 
Yeah. And I, I mean, knowing you, like you were doing the work, because I could see it's not like you took out, you know, 97 and credit cards and just like eating bonbons all day watching Netflix. Like that's not how you're going to get there. And that and that wouldn't have built on their work ethic. So you knew what you had to do. But yeah, I could see, you know, for me, my kids are 22 and 20. I've learned a lot from like stories like this on my own to give them the freedom to figure it out. But yeah, I can definitely see like you had to prove it in some way. And uh, don't get me wrong. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. There's a lot of bumps along the road. But what I tell people is that if you're going to fail, fail early and fail fast because then you learn from that lesson. And then the next time you come to the situation, you already have that information to to go forward, you know? Yeah. And I, I think like it's a personality thing. We, uh, I had another guest on Nick Cooley who said the same thing. Like they, we called it burn the bridges. Like you go all in on something because that's, what's going to motivate you. It might not work for somebody else. So you really do have to check your personality and say like, are you really going to do the work if you burn the bridges? Or are you just going to look at the ashes and be like, well, I guess I'll go back to the job because then there's no point. Don't burn the bridges then, right? Yeah. And the way I burned the bridges was, I mean, it was epic. Like yeah. there's no way I would <laughs> no ever be back. able to get a job again in that industry because of the way I left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, look, this is, again, this is not strict advice for somebody to use your playbook, but it's also yeah. a way to figure out how to get there. So what was the first type of property that you were interested in? How did you get into it with that? All the cash advances? Yeah. So I immediately lost $30,000. So that was like <laughs> within a couple months. So I was already in the hole, yeah. but I decided, Hey, let's start with something where I can make quick checks quickly. Cause I got interest in rent and stuff that I have to pay. So I started wholesaling, paid for a marketing campaign letters. I went down to the, the, the the courthouse in downtown Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah. I sat on the computer and I pulled all the probate deals that I could find. I sent out letters to the probate and the very first call I get was somebody yelling at me about how I'm a scammer. The second call I got was from the attorney general of Iowa asking if I was scamming people. And I was like, no, I went to this course. They said I can buy property and resell them and make a profit. He said, okay, if, if this isn't a scam, then I'll let you do it. So that was like already just a punch in the gut. You lose 30 grand. <laughs> your first call, someone yells at you and tells you you're a scammer. And then the second call is the attorney general being like, hey, if you mess yeah. up here, like there's legal implications for you. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, I think someone else will ask like, why didn't you quit then? Is it the same as what we talked about before? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where like there was no option to quit. It was, you just had to keep going. So eventually one hit, I got a, a duplex under contract. Then I had the problem where I didn't have buyers. So I had to go <laughs> out to my, my network again and say, hey, who knows how to sell this contract that I have now? So yeah. I always tell people, you don't need to know A through Z. You need to know A. And once you're done with A, then you can get to B. And you may have learned things in step A that allows you to get to, to B without knowing that before you started, right? So yeah. I, was just, I was just trusting in the process, you know? So I found a guy. We ended up joint venturing. He took half of my assignment fee, and I ended up making $2,500. And that was the best $2,500 I've ever made in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where you see it happen and realize there's a profit. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's like, well, I didn't lose money and I learned a lot. Like you learned a lot just on that first deal. You go from like, not just A to B, you go from like A to Z right away because every, and and I mean, I think probably all of us still do, you know, you probably still have deals where like, wow, that one never happened before. It's just that that's part of the process. So you you complete the duplex and then are you saying like, okay, this is it. I'm going to try to do this as many times as possible. Right. This works. I'm going to try to scale this up as fast as I can and not with the intent of staying a wholesaler because I didn't like the feeling of buying something or putting under contract to somebody else. And, you know, there's that Dealing with the uh, someone's investment, you like you said, a homeowner, you are an investor because it's the biggest investment yeah. in your life. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't like the feeling later on of you know somebody come back and say, "Well, I could have sold this for more to directly to your investor." Now they didn't have the network yeah. I had, they didn't have right. that, so I get it. So immediately, I took the proceeds from the wholesaling and started buying rental properties. Yeah, that's smart. That's that should that I mean, that should be the goal. I mean, there's definitely wholesalers who run it like a business and do it like a business. But I think what you said is really correct. There's just something because you're a middle person in wholesaling. It's just not necessarily as gratifying. It's just money gratifying. You can help people, but still, you're you're just the conduit. 
So it's right. only like a little bit fulfilling <laughs> and then sometimes not. And don't get me wrong. Like I, it's not like I did my first deal and started buying assignment, you know, yeah, yeah. during that while I was buying rentals, I was still wholesaling. We got to up to the point where we were doing like 70 contracts a year, 80 contracts a year. So we were making good money to buy these yeah. investment properties. Yeah. Yeah. Then enters my next phase of my life, which is having tenants. And looking back, <laughs> I wish I would have just skipped completely over this step because it was yeah. a nightmare, especially because I was chasing yield. So I was buying things in the south side of Chicago, yeah, uh, yeah. middle of nowhere, Indiana, because I saw some high cap rate on some spreadsheet. But then in reality, right. that's not what actually happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You were, you're chasing a solid cash flow means very difficult tenants. Usually, usually when the right. cash flow is overwhelmingly like, how is this even possible? It's usually because the tenants are difficult or there's, you know, uh, undone repairs. I'm just telling you right now, unless you're a huge company that knows how to operate in very challenging areas, you're not going to get those returns on paper. I'm just going to tell you, yeah, just assume yeah, yeah, 60, yeah, exactly. 50% of the time you're not going to get rent. Yeah. So your, your 18 cap is now like an eight, right? Or <laughs> exactly. less. So it's right. just not going to happen. Yeah. So I got tired of tenants, toilets, and trash very quickly. Evictions that lasted nine months, pouring concrete down the plumbing out of spite. Uh, it was just a nightmare. So I said, you know what? I can't, I can't deal with people anymore like this. So I said, okay, what assets can I go into where I don't deal with people? And the first was data centers. Didn't have, you know, $100 million to mount up my first data center. So that was immediately out. The second yeah. one was mobile home parks. And I called some people that I knew had mobile home parks and I was like, oh, you know, they just rent the lot, right? And he's like, dude, that's not actually how it happens. Either you're going to yeah, get yeah. those properties back, you're going to have tenants again. I'm just like, oh, okay. So that's not going to yeah. be an option. Yeah. And then I found out about self-storage and it checked all of the boxes. I said, you know what? No evictions. No one's allowed to live in my asset. Yeah. Everything's made out of concrete and steel. You can't damage it, you know, easily unless you run a, a truck into it. So I think this is the way that I'm going to go. And then immediately started to spin off uh, my entire rental portfolio. I didn't even care what the price was. I, I wasn't even trying to get the highest price. I was just trying to right. get rid of the headache. Yeah. So from 2016 to 2018, we were unwinding the, the rental portfolio, but I had to learn now a new asset class. So what did I do? I went back to my old friend wholesaling, yeah. but this time I was dealing business owner to business owner. And it was much more gratifying because- yeah. I didn't have this feeling of, oh man, you know, these people need this money to go pay rent or whatever. These, these guys already, you know, we're talking minimum purchase price, a million dollars. Right, right. Right. And I did this to test the, my knowledge and the market. If I could find a storage facility faster than a broker can find it, I can get it at a better price. And then I could sell it to someone that's got 30 years more experience than me for a higher price than I have for it. I'm probably doing something right. Yeah. And I mean, at the time when you got started in self storage, it wasn't like uh, widely known, like no one was talking about it on bigger pockets, like REITs weren't buying it, like none of this stuff was happening. So you had the competitive advantage of being ahead of the curve to try to figure out the business, wholesale the business. I mean, it's changed, but you know, you've upgraded your expertise in the area to make sure that you know what's going on. So when you first got to storage and realized like, wow, this seems a lot easier were you mad that you took the voyage that you had? Or was it just like, that's good experience to get here? Yes. Yes and no. Because, you know, in hindsight, everything's 2020. It's like, oh, I could have jumped straight into storage from the get-go. But at the same time, I wouldn't have known the things I had known about, about standing up a real estate investment business with lower stakes on single family and small multifamily. Plus, I wouldn't have had the startup capital. You know, yeah, if yeah. you're wholesaling a house or you're buying a house, you know, if you're going direct sellers, sometimes you can go get there with a hundred or a thousand dollars earnest money. Immediately, the very first deal I had, I had to put up twenty five thousand dollars. So if I had tried yeah. to start that, and that's a low earnest money, very, right, on a yeah, million dollar yeah. asset, twenty five thousand. Yeah. So it just, it, I'm, you know, I wish I'd gone faster. But hindsight is twenty twenty, and I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that likes to live with no regrets. So it, it is what it is. Yeah, but you you learn the lesson that we counsel a lot of people. They're like who who qualify somehow being a landlord as passive income, and we're just like, oh my god, like are you kidding? There's literally, I mean, there's nothing on earth that's less passive than being a landlord. They're like, oh, I'll get property management. It's like you still have to manage the manager. The manager's the one trying to skim you if you don't know them well. Like there's right. no ways that it goes fun. 
right. you know, oh, I, have, I have 20 multifamilies. It's so much fun. It's definitely not fun. Like you're getting calls about plumbing problems. And like you said, tenants putting things down the toilet. That's what they do. It happens. Right. Yeah. So, so tell us about self-storage and like, you know, your landmark principles of how you've grown your business around self-storage and why it's so much easier for you. And that's it. it and I think it's really important to know your personality. Like I don't like tenants either. You know, when I had uh, rentals, my sister, you know, dealt with the tenants and I dealt with the legal implications because I, it's just not for me. I don't want to do that type of thing. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's a couple main tenants that I love about self-storage and then I'll tell you how I, I, take a different approach to our business than most people do. Yeah. You know, number one, no evictions. It is lean law. Uh, so yeah, what happens <laughs> is when they put their stuff into your unit, they are de facto by state law giving you a lien over their property. And if they do not pay, depending on the state, within 45 days to 60 days of their first missed payment, you have already sold all their stuff off. You've recouped all of your losses. Now, if you make a profit, you can't take it. That extra money has to go back to the, them, or if you can't find them, it has to go right. to state unclaimed funds thing. So that's not a, a revenue generating. Yeah, spot. it's not really storage wars. Doesn't really work out no. the way it looks like it. Yeah, no. The second thing is when I look, I'm a data guy, right? I'm an engineer. So when I looked at back 30, 40 years and back tested my, my principles, I realized that self-storage was producing much higher than the other asset classes that I was looking at consistently, uh, even yeah. into today. Right. So it, it was something like a difference of over a 30 year period. If I started with a hundred thousand dollars, if I put in the S and P 500, it'd be like half a million. If I put it into the, into multifamily, it'd be like 1.8 million. And if I put it into storage, it was like 4.1 million because compounding is the yeah. eighth wonder of the world, right? Absolutely. So that's the the second reason I love it. And then the third reason I love it, it has this, this sticky factor. Once someone gets into a storage facility, <laughs> <laughs> for them to leave, it is such a pain. So you you can bump. I'm, I'm up. living that right now. I've told everybody that. Like you could you could go up on me. Like I, I hope my self storage facility is not listening. Like they go up probably like 15 bucks every. I don't even know how long. I, it's just not worth moving, right? That's what you're gonna say. I know it. It's just so annoying Death for me as a, as a someone. Thousand cuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a million, a million tiny yeah, paper million cuts. cuts. Yeah. yeah. So because of that. It, it allows us to keep up with inflation a lot faster than, say, a multifamily tenant that signs a one-year contract. My yeah. contracts, by state law, are 30-day contracts that auto-renew every 30 days, which means I can raise rents at any point as long as I give more than 30 days notice. Yeah. The, uh, so I, I love this 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 fast. I mean, look at industrial. People love industrial, but in industrial, you're locked into five to twenty five year contracts, depending on what yeah. type of tenant you have. And then if all of a sudden you have something like a COVID, where our inflation jumps up sixteen percent in like one night, you know, there's yeah. nothing you could do. You're locked yeah, in. But that the, it's funny though because we were talking like compound interest how good that is but that's really basically self storage it's like if you just if you look at the time like if i look at what i paid when i first got my storage unit and what i'm paying now i want to jump out a window but just those little things it just doesn't make it worth it you know at some point i have to just move but then i'll move to a storage unit they're just going to do the same thing so, like cuz that it's, it's, it's fair it's just just part of the business and they do i mean there are ways to make self storage now which i'm sure we'll talk about much more technologically advantageous to you less staff uh, which is probably part of the way you turn around facilities Right. So those are a couple of the reasons. I have a whole presentation on like 11 reasons why I love self-storage, but we don't have enough time here. So if anybody wants to find that, just follow our social media or, you know, maybe I could come on again. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. I remember them because you, you you gave it to us on the, on the mastermind and they're very solid. Yeah. Right. So now let's let's talk about how I decided to approach a storage business differently. Yeah. Most people they approach a real estate investment business as a real estate investment business. And that is the wrong way to approach a business. You need to approach this business as a marketing company. That is what it truly is at, at its core of every part of the, the, the chain. So number one, marketing to get deal flow, off-market deal flow, or even on-market deal flow, as long as you have yeah, the right yeah. connection. So that allows me to get a first look at every property before anybody else does. And I can make an offer faster because I had marketing to get the best people Right. Yeah. And then I have the ability to cherry pick. 
and there'll be, I can pick the cream of the crop. And then if there's still deals that are very good, but I just don't want to put my money into them or they don't match my investment thesis, I have to market to find other buyers. And then one of my tools in the tool bed is I can wholesale off contracts to help pay for the marketing or for down payments on existing facilities, right? Yeah, yeah. The other piece is you're scaling up a business and eventually you run out of your own capital. And then you eventually run out of your friends and your family's capital. And you <laughs> still want to you still want to build this up. So where do you find money? So now you got to create a marketing arm just for capital, just for right. real estate investors, you know, and passive and passive investors. So now you have to go on this massive marketing campaign. You have to get your, your name known. You have to present at conferences and masterminds and speak on podcasts like we're doing right yeah. now for people to know who you are, right? And then you have to get them through the investment funnel to get them to say, yes, I would like to give you my money so that you can give me a good return on an asset, right? Yeah. So that's the way that we always approached it. Yeah, I mean, I like it. And I've always said, I think that I, I've always thought that the best wholesalers are actually investors who become the best marketers. And then they have overage. They, they, they're so good at marketing. Like you said, hey, I'm getting first look. I can cherry pick the top ones. But like, why would I give up money on the rest? So then I'm going to wholesale the rest. Eventually, you can say, okay, well, we can keep them all. We're going to build a fund. But like, that just goes to exactly what wholesaling is all marketing. <laughs> I mean, right. that. That's what you're just trying to get enough things in the funnel so you have things to choose from. I think that's a really, really good point that you made about that. Yeah. So now, you know, fl flash forward to today, we have basically these three and a half strategies, the half being the wholesale. The first is what we started with, which is buying these smaller secondary and tertiary market mom and pop deals. These are good because day one, they are cash flowing. So it makes it easier to get debt from a bank. It makes it easier to get yeah. money from an investor that wants something that's going to produce, you know, quarterly distributions. And then what we do is we do the value add, maybe we expand some of them, and then we put them into a larger portfolio and sell off the larger portfolio to a, a next level buyer, not another Fernando, because another Fernando yeah. is going to try to beat me up on price and get a good deal because Fernando has a high cost of capital. Right. He's paying anywhere between 18 to 25 percent just on his equity. And then the debt yeah. is like right, right now is like eight, eight and a half percent. Right. So that's a yeah. very high average cost of capital. However, if I can make this a large enough portfolio that I can appeal to someone that has the power to like sell bonds in Europe, like an extra yeah. space and raise half a billion dollars at less than one percent return. And then they have a credit line with, you know, let's say Blackstone. And that credit line is a revolving line based off their assets. So the rate is at, you know at the time 2.1 or 2.5 percent yeah they can buy let's say their combined cost of capital is two percent so they can buy a four or a five cap and immediately double their money where i right. if i buy a four or a five cap i'm having my money immediately right yeah and it also helps them diversify their portfolio with something that's a very solid asset like you said and i something that i consider recession proof really there's no way it goes wrong you know recession goes bad people move into smaller houses still have the same amount of stuff yeah goes great house is still the same size they get more stuff no place to put it that's right so that's that's where the opportunity is right that's my first strategy i'll tell you the other two but that's where yeah. one of the largest opportunities in the self-storage space right now is is because of this aggregation that's going on storage right now is where multifamily was in the 80s where these big guys are trying to get as much of it as they can because they control three trillion dollars of investment capital and they need to put it on the street yeah. And um, but one one reason why what you can do works so well is because the bigger conglomerates, they're not going to, to the mom and pop. It's not worth them to try to buy one mom and pop or even take the time to negotiate that. So they need you to take it, put it into a smaller portfolio that becomes bigger so they can buy it. Right. Yeah, because think about their overhead. You know, you have you have Ivy League analysts that have very high salaries. What this does not worth the time of even one employee yeah. to <laughs> negotiate a million dollar facility. Deal. <laughs> yeah, just it doesn't make sense. But if you bring a portfolio of twenty of these assets, and now the purchase price is in the twenty five to fifty million dollar range, now it makes sense to have that Ivy League kid spend his one hundred and eighty thousand dollar a year salary underwriting your portfolio because it's a one large check you know yeah and you and you've also presented a much better product for them to underwrite on their own instead of trying to figure out you know you know mom and pop storage it's like you're like oh let me see the books and they pull out like a piece of paper and you're like oh, really yeah like, legal this is how I've we do it had, <laughs> i've already had uh sellers where i asked them to email me their pnls and they literally mail me a yellow legal pad 
information with all their financials on it. Yeah. It's like, okay, I guess we're doing this. When, when the pad comes out from under the table on a self-storage appointment, you know, like due diligence is going to be fun. But you also know you're going to make a lot of money exactly. on that deal. <laughs> it's in there. It's in there. They haven't accounted for a lot of things. They don't know a lot of the numbers. There's definitely money to be made. That's exactly right. true. And also these larger buyers, you know, as you keep going up the feeding chain, they don't want hassle. So they're not going to go do a value add like this. They're going to want me to do it, stabilize the asset, put technology yeah. in place so it, you can run it from an armchair and then sell it in a portfolio with 20 others that are identical to it. Yeah. Right. Hey, this is Jonathan. Thanks for listening to another episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. On this brief interlude, I wanted to tell you that we have a mailing list. I actually don't love mailing lists. There's so much. This is not an automated mailing list where you get on a drip campaign. These are written once a month, will eventually be at once a week again by me direct and they're not spammy. So if you want to sign up for our mailing list, you can go to bit.ly slash streamlined with a D mail. Bit.ly is B-I-T dot L-Y slash streamlined mail. See you there. So that that is vertical number one. The problem with vertical number one is it takes a long time to get a lot of square footage under your belt, right? Yeah. So then once I had enough capital and experience to start building them, we went to vertical number two, which is building class A REIT grade facilities. So instead of buying, you know, Joe's storage of 20,000 net rentable square feet, I'm building, you know, Social self storage, three story, 120,000 net rentable square feet. Six of Joe's facilities in one with rents that right. are three times the cost, right? So that's what we started doing buying land. And now we had to learn a new vertical. I know how to find storage. I know how to underwrite storage. How do I find land and underwrite land to make sure I'm not overpaying, right? right? Yeah. So then, new marketing company that we had to form basically it's inside of our company to figure out how to do that. That is all fine and dandy, but then all of a sudden the pandemic hits, okay? And we have supply chain shortages. That Big time. plus that Su Suez Canal thing that happened. So yeah. all of a sudden I had, you know, uh, RTU or an electrical panel that they told me was six weeks out. And then now they're like, it's question mark when it's going to show up. It may right. be in six 12 months. Six months to two years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, I can't get certificate of occupancy, aka I can't start getting cash flow on this asset where my debt is costing me 80 to 100K a month. Yeah. That's a huge issue that we're having, right? So then we formed the, our third vertical because at the same time, big box retail was failing. No one could leave the house. Everybody went to Amazon and is yeah. destroying companies like Sears, Circuit City, Best Buys, things like that. But they have yeah. these types of properties are in prime real estate locations, high visibility, high traffic counts, high median incomes, and surrounded by dense residential, which is exactly yeah. what you want for storage. Yeah, they've done all of the demographic research for you, place the building. It's just whether you can acquire it, right? Exactly. I always tell this, it's a joke, but it's actually kind of true. In our company, we say, if I can smell McDonald's and see a Walmart, it's probably yeah. a good place to put I, storage. I agree. Yeah. And and even better, now we, we, we like to follow, this is a secret, so don't tell anybody. Yeah. But what we like to do now is we follow where Sherwin-Williams stores go as well wow. as Home Depots. They have some of the yeah. best demographic underwriting we've ever seen. So if you can if you can see now a Sherwin-Williams, so if you can smell paint and smell sawdust, you're probably yeah. doing good in, on right. your location. Stop with the coffee and Whole Foods. Oh, those, those, are, those are pretty good also in Trader Joe's. But I like that. It really makes sense. It also goes to where there's going to be more development, most likely, because they've done the research on the development. That just means more incoming. And then you can be way ahead of the curve on the price, right? And that's where the the big cash cow is buying, right? Yeah, this is great, great advice. Instead of me, instead of me buying a, a million dollars an acre because it's already, I'm already saturated around me. Right. Now I'm buying, you know, as low as twenty five thousand dollars an acre because I know in the next five years I will become saturated, and then I can sell off the facility for even much more. Right? That's where the demand. We're looking for where the demand drivers are coming. Yeah. Oh, that's outstanding. So because of that, we started going to these areas where, you know great visibility, great location. And the only problem was that no one could leave the house. So I was able to buy like, for example, we did one outside of Columbus 
where we bought a Sears building for $9 a foot. In some markets, that's what you rent that space for, yeah, $9 yeah, right. a foot per month, right? Now, we bought the facility or we bought the shell. And that did two things for us. One, we already we were walled in. We're away from the elements because you can't pour concrete in the winter in the north. You can't pour concrete in the dead of summer in the south because it's either too hot or too cold. So now we're, we're compressing our timeline, which means now I'm saving that sixty dollars to $80,000 a month yeah. in interest by right. cutting you know three or six months off of my, my build time. The second thing is now my total project cost also drops because I already have the, the structure up. So now all I got to do is maybe do some MEP, maybe do roof and facade, if depending on how bad the condition is, like, like uh, Kmart's are the worst. They never took care of anything. Sears yeah. building's very good, right? And then I just bring in the lockers and doors and that's it. Yeah. 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 I mean, you have the shell, you're just trying to figure out how to configure the inside, which is, is winter friendly as well. Right. So now I drop from, you know, going 125 bucks a foot down to like 80 and that's all in. That's, that's hard cost, soft cost, land, interest reserve, everything. And then I also go from a 12 month build time to CEO to like six or eight months build time to CEO. So that's the third strategy that was basically born out of the pandemic. Cause we had to figure again, failure is not an option, especially now that I have investors. I have a lot yeah. of investors. I have 700 bosses, right? I have to make sh this work. <laughs> yeah. And I think that the pandemic showed us in regard to self-storage is like, it's going to be even more valuable because everybody's home. Everybody's just ordering too much stuff on Amazon. You can't leave. So there's not enough space. So you need to get a space to put the junk that you're not going to use until later. You know, it's just the way that it goes. In 2021, my portfolio on average, we increased our rents 81% year over year. Because That's the demand wild. is so, because yeah. like in storage, you do not want a hundred percent occupancy. If you have a hundred percent occupancy, that means that you are charging too little. Too little, so right? We, we always want a few of each unit type available, and we just keep jacking up the rents until someone's just like, "I don't want to rent at this price." I'm like, "Okay, I found the market price. Let's right, back right. it down five bucks, yeah. and then that's where we're going to sit." And during the pandemic, people are like, "I don't care." I just need, I have to, I have, my kids have to, I have to turn my second bedroom into a school learning location. Right, I have to turn right. my third bedroom into my office now. Like, I do not care. Just give me the unit. We yeah. had wait lists that were like six, eight months long. It was crazy. It makes sense though. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people went and bought houses, but then they realized like, oh, well, we kind of quick bought that house. Now we still need self-storage. So, yep. and we yep. overpaid for the house because we were in a panic. Right. Yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I think so, we did, did. We get to the last pillar. Yeah. So those are the three main pillars. But then again, that that half pillar was if a deal came across the table where I just it didn't fit our investment thesis, or now because we have larger limited partners that come in and they have a specific buy box where I have to be in a you know whatever top fifty MSA, it has to have these type of demographics because that's what you said you'd buy when yeah. we gave gave you the money. Then I can also just move that over to other other investors that maybe it's their fifth facility only or or their first or even you know we have some buyers that they're on facility 70 right they're larger than us but they have yeah. less restrictive criteria than we do yeah no i mean uh, I, I feel like this is an asset class that should be really interested for the people who like you and i like just landlording sucks for them because this is just modified you there, there's almost no contact with with the the you know quote tenants the people who hold the units right it's all automated or electronic now there are systems out there there's a competitor of ours that they 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 do their business really good they're 100% unmanned facilities you yeah. rent on your phone or on your your computer you get a QR code you get a code to enter the the you can unlock your your the gate to enter the facility with your phone you can unlock your specific unit with your phone but the the technology package now is getting to a point where it is making things really advantageous however because there's this private equity money that just enters the self, self storage has always been a laggard when it comes to adopting technology right yeah. it's it's the it's the old guy in the corner that says, why do you need a, a internet in your pocket? Right. It doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, yeah. But look at all of us now. We, we're on our phone for everything because only 
this injection of PE money came in so fast. There's only one or two huge technology companies in our space. And because of that, they are driving prices. So this, these technology packages right now, they make sense if you're a longer term hold type person. Yeah. But for me, where you know we're in and out of facilities every you know two to five years, the payback period just doesn't make sense yet. But what we've been seeing is now there's some smaller smaller groups coming in trying to disrupt the market, take market share away from these behemoths, and are starting to introduce alternative technology that we can use at a lower price. So I, every year I'm seeing the price drop, drop, drop. For example, there's something called the Janus No Key, which is what I was talking about with the with the phone. You can unlock your unit with your phone. That, when they first introduced it, was $500 a door. Now it's like 200 And I, I'm seeing the price drop, drop. It's just com- t- continue to go down. So I think it's good for the industry. Yeah. One thing I was thinking, though, if you look at traditional, like the start of self-storage, it wasn't really for all of these areas that it works for now. It was like really in the, you know, these Midwest pockets where nobody was trying to open it with the phone. You were just opening a garage door, put a tractor in or something. So, I mean, those are the ones that still exist. And I don't know that that your clientele at those are going to be the technologically friendly type. Certainly at some point, it helps you as as an owner to kind of retrofit and make the management easier. But like, I do feel like there could be some that go too much. If you're in an area that's like super techy, you know, sure. If you have an, a facility in Austin, I would really do it up because everyone's going to be tech friendly. They're probably storing some important stuff in there. But, you know, like you said, if you're back in Des Moines, Iowa, where you were at the time, maybe that's not the type of facility that's going to work there. It could, but maybe not at the same scale. Do you agree with that? Yeah. And I'd say it's it's less a thing of, you know, about city and it's more about rents. So, you know, if we're in in a location like a top MSA where rents are 23 to 29 bucks a foot, you could put full packages on right, because right. you have money to play with. But if you're, let's say, in Portland, Indiana or in uh, Mansfield, Louisiana, where rents are eight bucks a foot. Yeah. You don't have the money to play with to put all these fancy bells and whistles in there. Yeah, but that's important for people to know who want to get into the space and just think like, oh, I'm going to make it, you know, super tech friendly, but they want something that's affordable. So they buy something in one of those areas, like we say great areas, but not maybe necessarily ready for that uptake. They could spend a bunch of money and then realize like, no, you're still at eight bucks, you know, eight bucks a square foot. You're trying to get 20, but the, the area doesn't support that. Right. It's like you're you're trying to build a McMansion where it's all three bedroom ranches, you know? Yeah, right. You best be house sell on, it for your cost. Yeah, no, don't be the best house on the block because you, you, no one else is want to upgrade their home at the same point. I think those are really important. Uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the demographics because this is something that we've talked about before. Uh, if you were picking like the top three characteristics, what are the top three characteristics? Like when you're doing that full due diligence phase is like in terms of like traffic patterns, population growth, which are the top three things that you're looking for that tell you like this location is suitable for a facility that can scale and sell? Yeah. So there's a, you know, it depends on if we're trying to buy an existing facility or if we're trying to develop a new facility. Right. So right. if we're trying to enter into a market, the, the number one thing I look at is competitor occupancy. If everybody is at 90, 95, 100% occupancy, that, there, that means that there's unmet demand in that yeah. market. So that's number one. And then once I look at that market and I see that it's these occupancies are super high, then I look at what is the average rent per square foot that is in that market. If it's 23 plus, I'm going to put up a three-story, multi-story building, right? Three-story, state-of-the-art, class A REIT style building. If it's a 12 to 18-ish, then we're looking at single-story climate control. And if it's below 12, then I personally wouldn't, but other people would build kind of these class C drive-up facilities, no climate control. All gravel, no road type of stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's just the pull up, the pull up kind with the master lock, right? So that's the first thing I look at. The second thing is when I'm looking for your, you know, what is Fernando's wish list type thing. On top of those, I want to see uh, high population counts within a five, 10, 15 uh, minute drive radius around yeah. that facility. You know, in a fifteen minute drive time, if I can be above a hundred thousand people. 150,000 people, that is A plus, right? Yeah. I'll do yeah. less, but that you're asking for the wish list. The second thing is median household incomes. Because if if a household doesn't make enough money to to purchase 
food and pay for rent, things like that, they're not going to have money to buy extra things and let alone pay someone else to store those extra things outside of their house. So right. minimum, they'll get minimum. a shed that costs nothing, stuff the stuff in a shed if they have to. Yeah. So minimum, we're, we're talking 60000 per household. I like it to be higher. You know, if I'm going to be building a class A three-story facility, I want 100K yeah, per household that makes sense. or better. And then uh, high traffic counts. So for us, we, you know, depending on the type of facility, 16,000 cars per day is the minimum. I prefer 25 plus, you know, the ideal spots are on the off ramp of a uh, interstate. Like if you're on I-65 and right when you turn off on the turn lane or the turn ramp, there's a storage facility right there. That's perfect. Cause now you're getting a hundred thousand cars per day that are seeing your facility. Yeah. And the thing about storage is most storage users they don't notice the self storage facilities that they're driving by. It's almost subconscious until they need it. And then they know yeah. it, usually it's, it's within five or 10 minutes of either work or home. That's it. Right. Yeah. And all off the highway, easily accessible to multiple people, you know, to use. So it's just much, much easier. It, I mean, even if they're in industrial parks, that's how easy it is to get to it. That is the important thing. Right. So traffic counts, you know, 25,000 plus is, is what I'm looking for. So that's, that's, it's pretty, it's, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a complex business. You know, there's just a couple core tenants. As long as you don't, you know, put on some rosy colored glasses, it is a pretty, pretty easy strategy to execute. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is something I wanted to ask because I think it might help people. How strict do you stay to your buy box? Because it sounds like you specifically really have lined out your buy box and it's like either in or out. And I think I think a lot of people can learn from that in any aspect of investing because the second that you stray, you realize why you have the buy box in the first place. Right. So the reason my buy box is so restrictive is because of the quality of my deal flow. The amount of deals that I get to see on a weekly basis allows me to be extremely strict. When I first started, it, it was, is this a <laughs> self-storage facility? All right. right. Thumbs up. Yeah. That's awesome. Right. You know? right. It seems great. Let's make a deal. Yeah, because it's the only one I saw so far, right? Yeah. So it went it went from you know, my strategy now is to build a billion dollar company in the next 10 years. So to do that, I need to have institutional quality assets that I can exit all at once to a publicly traded REIT. And publicly traded REITs, they like things that are homogenous. They like things yeah. that look the same, that operate the same, because then it's it's it becomes almost like a security. And all the things inside of it are are the same, you know, like a mortgage-backed security when you go buy a CMBS pool. Yeah. So that is why for us, and I can tell you my buy box in case there's any wholesalers or aspiring wholesalers out there that would like to send me some deals. Yeah. We look for deals that start off at 35,000 square feet or larger. And the reason for that is below 35,000 square feet, managing these things becomes very cost prohibitive when you bring in a third party like we do now. We used to self manage, yeah. we don't do that anymore. With the ability to expand and increase the footprint of that facility over 65,000 square feet in the next 13 months. And these numbers are very special for this reason. Typically, things that are below the 50,000 square foot buy box or even 45,000 square foot buy box, you're not competing against REITs to buy those, right? But it's still large enough. And if it comes with a little bit of additional land, then I can turn it into a REIT yeah. great asset. So I pay mom and pop pricing, but then I sell REIT pricing. Right. Yeah. So that that is is the strictest part of our buy box is size. And then the second strictest part is the revenue generation. Once this thing is stabilized, it has to produce more than fifty thousand dollars a month in gross revenue. And that comes down to, again, the third party management using these institutional management partners, but as well as just economies of scale. You know, if I can have a couple facilities all in one location and I can hire a, a district manager, you know, that district manager is 100% pure overhead. So if I have yeah. facilities that are large enough that can carry that manpower, then it's going to work out well. And again, I'm selling to people that have a similar structure. They have district managers, they have regional managers, they have a lot of overhead because they're publicly traded companies. 
Yeah, I can see why this is so attractive, though, to your investors, you know, who want to invest with SSSE, because it's like, you know, there's an out like you have a plan, you're saying like, we're trying to get these to be regrade so we can sell them in bulk, which means the returns going to come sooner, you're not really trying to wait it out. You know, the whole goal is to package these up and sell them. And I think that makes going into a syndication for the investor. Okay, we know the out maybe it's a three year expected, but it's probable that you might get it out before that. Right. And that I don't think I specifically told you what type of compression we get, but on our portfolio sales, if we were to sell them individually versus selling them in a portfolio, we're seeing anywhere from 100 to 200 basis points compression on the cap rate. So a deal that I would have sold at a seven cap individually in a yeah. portfolio, I could sell for a five. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the benefit of exactly what you're doing. But you, but it takes a lot of work to get there to make them all this way. So I think, you know, we don't want people to miss that, that you're trying to package multiple facilities together, upgrade them all, increase the size, but then also increase the package so that's attractive to somebody do the due diligence. So it's easier for them, even with those IV educations, <laughs> looking through yeah. it, you know, the better package that you can present, the easier it is to buy. And I would guess that now, with all of your experience, you can go back to the same people and say, hey, like, hey, are you guys interested in another one? So you don't have to do the same amount of marketing on the end sale for the REITs because they all know you. They know you've produced right. similar deals that have been great, right? Yeah, exactly. And then also, you know, we, we rub shoulders with the top 100 operators in the country. We go yeah. to Self Storage World Expo in Vegas in April. We go to the SSA meeting spring and fall and they're all there, right? Because they're looking yeah, for yeah. deals. Right. So you, all of a sudden you, you start having cocktails, you're sitting at whatever the craps table. I'm not a gambler, but you know, for this it's fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's a little overstimulating, but the yeah. nice thing is all of a sudden you, you know, there's 2000, 3000 people at this one casino for this event. And everyone right. we talk to is like, Oh, I'm head acquisition for public storage, or I'm an acquisition manager for extra space or, and it's, yeah. and then all of a sudden I have, now I've just cut out brokers because I don't need, yeah. If I already know, the, and I ask them, what type of product are you looking for? Give me your buy box. And then I specifically start building and buying facilities that fit their buy box. So yeah. I already know who the exit's for, you know? Right. Yeah. No, that's really important. Wow. This has been great masterclass in uh, self-storage acquisition and management here. Fernando, where is the best place for people to find out? I'm guessing it's SSSE.com. That's if you're more type of passive person, that is where you're going to go. If you are somebody that likes to kind of grab the bull by the horns, what I do for everyone, especially on podcasts of this quality, is I'm going to give out my cell phone number. It's area code 630-408-8090. That's my real phone number. You can call text. <laughs> text is the, the fastest. If you better, want yeah. the response immediately, but you can call as well. But yeah, if you want to see... You know, if you want to sign up as, as an investor, you want to sign up as a buyer, go to triplese.com. If you want to learn about how to do self-storage, the best place to go is to our social medias. All of them are sssse.com, or you can follow me, which is The Storage Stud on every social media uh, yeah. handle there. I didn't come up with that name. That was that was Steven, our, our, my business partner, who's a marketing genius. Um, so It's a good title. I like it. And I always tell people, I like remembered, like after I met you the first time, I was like, well, wait, what was his name? Like Storage Stud, Storage Stud, go for that. And then I found him like, oh, all right, it's Fernando. Okay, all right, let's go. Yeah, I like it. We yeah, post, so you can we post stuff three, three times, to four times a day, videos, podcasts, how to's. You can literally sit right behind us and watch us how we do our business. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, it's good to be back in touch with you. And I appreciate you spending yeah. the time giving all the self storage knowledge. So thanks for spending it even with the cold and you didn't cough or sneeze once did it great, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm holding it hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right when it ends, it's going to be a, it's going to be big. I really appreciate it. That was Fernando Angelucci. The storage side His company is triple S E S S S E.com. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green, 
And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor. Like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends, and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening. Listening.